Dr. John here with NBC News. I am going to cover some headlines that you probably heard over the last week. Get behind those headlines, get a little deeper into an understanding of what's going on there, and hopefully, hopefully give you a better understanding of what's happening right now with the coronavirus pandemic, and then we'll certainly answer some questions. So please, if you have questions, send them our way so I can get to as many of those as I can during the time we have. But first, starting with the headlines. First and foremost, you've probably heard a lot about the vaccine and different things about vaccines and what's happening around the world. Well, right now, there are over 200 vaccine companies working on trying to get that vaccine. They're doing a variety of different testings. They're at different stages. There are approximately 15, maybe more right now, that are heading into human trials. Some are at phase three trials. And let me explain a little bit about how it works here in the United States and in most countries around the world. Uh, usually what happens is you have to get through three phases of trials. The first phase, phase one, is a very small trial. It's usually on a handful of people, a few dozen people. They try to make sure it's safe for them and show some bit of e effectiveness, but mainly looking at safety. Phase two, they go into that. That's usually a few hundred people. With phase two, they look at safety and efficacy, that effectiveness very closely. But these are very strict requirements on which people can get into these studies. And so they usually typically have adults that are healthy. They look at the vaccine to see if it's safe and effective. And then they do phase three. Phase three typically right now for most of these groups is looking at between 10 and 30,000 people across a spectrum of the population different ethnicities, different medical conditions, different ages to find out, again, with the priority being, is this vaccine safe and is this vaccine effective? Is it doing what we want it to do? And the reason this is a concern is because vaccines have the potential to actually make things worse. So they want to make sure they get through these three trials in humans, increasing the number as each trial goes on over time. That's why it takes so long. And right now we're looking at, for the most part, here in the U.S., in Europe and other countries as well, Looking at getting a vaccine probably at the beginning of the year, maybe come springtime before we get that vaccine FDA approved. Once it's FDA approved, they already have production in place. They'll start distributing it. The reason it's hitting the news right now is for a couple of reasons. One, Russia announced this week that they have a trial they're going to start giving to people. Sorry, they have a vaccine they're going to start giving to people. Well, that raised a lot of red flags around the world with other experts saying, whoa, wait a minute, because what Russia is saying is we have gone through or right now we're doing phase two. We're about to go into phase three, but we're going to go ahead and release it to people. That vaccine would never be approved at this stage here in the United States, Europe or other countries as well, because it has not gone through that phase three. That phase three is critical. And as I tell people all the time, the road is paved with companies with drugs and vaccines that look great in phase one, look great in phase two, didn't make it in phase three, did not show the safety, did not show the effectiveness we wanted in phase three, so the FDA would not approve it. This one, since it has not gone through phase three, they are essentially gambling with these people's lives to get them this vaccine. You look at risks versus benefits, and we definitely need a vaccine. We do understand that. And so the benefits of getting a vaccine are important, but that risk it can't be higher than the benefit of receiving a vaccine. And that's the concern right now with the Russian vaccine. So you may have heard that they have one. How come we don't have one? Well, we don't have one yet because we're making sure we're very diligent about getting through those three stages of clinical trials, phase three coming up. Phase three is going to give us much more answers than we get from phase one and phase two. Russia has decided to go ahead and preempt that, get the vaccine out before they start phase three. We'll see what happens. Hopefully nobody gets hurt over this. Hopefully there's no issues, but the concern is there could be. On top of that, you might have heard also about companies or a company is developing the virus itself. They're producing the virus in case other companies want to do what are called challenge trials. Explain a little bit here. So what happens is, especially when they get to phase three of these clinical trials, is, again, they look at 30,000 people. They give usually half of them the vaccine. The other half, they either give a different vaccine or a placebo. And then what they do is they look at them in their regular lives out in the population and what happens. What they're hoping to see is, number one, it's safe, but number two, that the people that get the vaccine are more protected from, in this case, coronavirus than people who did not get the vaccine. In order to do that, they have, have enough of the virus circulating in the population in order to make sure that they have good statistics, good data behind this. Part of the problem is 
because this vaccine tends to wax and wane, and we've seen this happen where New York City, for example, April, bad time in New York City, it was leading the world in, in coronavirus cases, and now it's doing much, much better. So if they had a population that got vaccinated in April against the virus, they really wouldn't be able to study them that well right now because there isn't much virus there to begin with. And so you need that load of virus, that level of virus in the community to get a good understanding. And since it's difficult to do with coronavirus, it's going to take more time. Some people are saying, well, let's do what are called challenge trials. In other words, we give people the vaccine, we give people a placebo, and then we give them both coronavirus to see if they're able to fight off coronavirus, or at least the people with the vaccine give them coronavirus to see if that'll help. Now, for some things, that's okay to do mainly because for those diseases we have treatments for. But for a disease where we have no treatments and we know there's a complication rate, we know there's a death rate associated with it, and the death rate, the, the complications and the deaths can hit any population, granted more so if you're older with pre-existing medical conditions, but at the same time, we don't know who, who's going to have the blood clotting issues. We don't know who's going to have the pneumonia or other types of issues associated with this. It's unethical to give them this virus at this point without having treatment that could treat some of these complications and prevent some of the deaths just to see if the vaccine works. So a lot of experts are saying this is not where we should be right now. This is a plan later down the road if we really need to go to something like this. But the company is producing the virus, I think, so that way we have it ready in case we need to use it. We get to a point where we have treatments that are effective and we can actually treat people on a regular basis to find out if the vaccine works. But in the meanwhile, there won't be challenge trials. It'll just be the regular population trials to see if this vaccine works. So that's vaccines in a nutshell. Looking at the world in general and what's going on in the world, and what you're seeing is that in some situations where they had strict lockdowns and they were able to get out of coronavirus trouble, in other words, their cases were much, much better controlled, well, they started opening up and started relaxing. And now we're seeing what's happening when that happens too quickly in a fashion where they're not keeping things controlled, they're not keeping an eye on it. Spain probably being the best example in Europe. And right now, according to the European CDC, what they're saying is Spain right now is second in Europe, right behind Luxembourg, with 110,000 cases per 100,000 people. So 110, sorry, 110 cases per 100,000 people. If you compare that to France and Italy, France has 34 cases per 100,000. Italy has 8.4. What's the difference between all those? Well, they all had huge cases of coronavirus back in the springtime. Those cases have gotten under control because of strict measures, including masks, social distancing, closing businesses down. Italy and France slowly opened things up, kept a close eye on what was going up, going on, and incrementally kept opening things and slowing down if cases started cropping up. Spain, on the other hand, opened up more freely, plus Spain is a more social society, and so people tend to gather together, and that's why they think those numbers in Spain are much, much higher than France or Italy. This should be a lesson to all of us, especially here in the U.S., that opening too quickly, opening too fastly, and not paying attention to what's happening in the community can have these repercussions of making things uh, explode much faster with these coronavirus cases, which means they're going to have to roll back those openings. And rolling back those openings is the last thing any of us want to have happen, but might need to be happen, might need to happen in order to keep the cases under control. So it, just an example. Another example as to how this virus is difficult to control. New Zealand, an island, 5 million people, they were able to get coronavirus under control for 102 days, had absolutely no cases of coronavirus. And they were very strict. If you came into the country, you had to quarantine. It was a supervised quarantine for 14 days. But then they were able to open up their country. They went to what they call phase one or level one, which means they're essentially back to normal. Well, over the past few days, they've reported 17 cases. It originally started with one family of four cases and now has spread to other families as well or other areas. They're not sure exactly why this is happening. But what this shows is even with a country with strict measures, strict protocols, this virus can still get in there. They're looking at going back to some of the closings, particularly in Auckland. They have closed down a lot of things in Auckland to try and keep it under control. They're looking at the rest of the country to see what will happen. But what this does show us is that making sure that those reopenings are done slowly in a deliberate fashion, looking at an eye in the community in a number of cases, and being ready to be flexible and roll back some of those openings is important to keep it under control. And then the last headline I want to talk about are masks. There's been a lot of information about masks recently. Number one, the CDC just came out with information and saying, if you wear a mask with a valve on it, you need to stop wearing that mask. And the example I have here, I do not have a mask with a valve on it, but essentially... 
it looks like an N95 mask, but it has a little valve on the side. The reason they say they don't want you to use that is these masks are made for two different purposes. They're made to protect me from anybody else who might have coronavirus trying to send it my way, and they're made to protect other people in case I have coronavirus, might not know it because I don't have the symptoms, and a lot of people don't. And so the mask is protecting them. The problem with these valves, the reason the valves are there, they make it easier to exhale. They make it easier to get the breath out of your lung, past the mask, and out into the air. Since it's a one-way valve pushing the air out or allowing it more freely to go out, that virus can get out as well. And so this mask, which is arguably mainly meant to protect others from me, isn't working with that valve in place. So the CDC is saying, don't use that valve. Don't use a mask with valves. Make sure they don't have valves. On top of that, there's other stories. There's another story out about masks themselves. And it was a study that was done looking at masks to find out which ones work best. And what they found in the study, and it wasn't, it wasn't a study looking particularly at masks. It was a study looking at ways you could look at masks. And what they did is they found out with simple lasers and photography, they were able to find out how much masks filtered out those particles when somebody simply toss, talked wearing a mask. And what they found were that these masks, obviously the N95s work the best, especially if they're fitted like we do in a hospital setting. But on top of that, they also found that surgical masks, these simple surgical masks, or even homemade masks with two or more layers of material in them worked almost as well, especially if they're worn correctly. The interesting part they found is that gaiters, and I have a gaiter here. I use this for mountain biking all the time. And what I typically do is have it down when I'm out by myself, and sometimes I'll be miles away from other people. If I see people coming close to me, I'll put it back up. What I've been doing, though, is because I noticed that I could breathe very easily through it, which is one of the reasons that we wear it, is I doubled it up. So I wasn't able to breathe quite as easily, but okay enough to where I could keep exercising. But it wouldn't get those particles out there exhaled as much. And that's what the study is showing, too, that if you have a gaiter, a neck gaiter with just one layer, it was almost worse than not wearing one, according to these scientists, because it seemed to break the particles into smaller particles, which could float in the air longer. But a few caveats here. One that they didn't they only looked at one gator it was a playtex spandex or it was a polyester spandex gator and they said that was the one that showed it broke the particles up a little bit they only looked at it in one person in one trial so they don't know what it means for other ones they don't know what it means to double up or even triple up the fabric so other experts are saying well we can't give up on gators yet they might help a little bit but food for thought think about doubling up on that gator material when you're out and about in public if you're using it and um, bandanas the same thing bandanas seem to work in the same fashion or not work very well in the same fashion so again looking at the headlines the vaccine we talked about Russia with their vaccine being released, but here in the U.S. that would not be approved because it has not gone through phase three trial. The world examples are showing us that we need to be very careful about reopenings, very careful about gatherings, because we're seeing in some areas, some countries, that they reopen too quickly, uh, too much, and it's causing issues right now. And then masks. Masks with valves you want to get rid of. If you're using a gator, think about doubling over the material to help other people around you out. So now let me see if you have any questions. What do you think about kids going back to school? So the big question is, what do I think about kids going back to school? And NBC News has this whole week covered school and issues of reopening schools. And if you talk to different experts, you're going to get a lot of different opinions. Matter of fact, we had a special last night with myself and some other experts on talking exactly about this topic. And what it boils down to is there's no one size fits all. There's no one thing, one guideline, one requirement, one recommendation that's going to fit the entire country. So what it comes down to is what's happening in your community because that's the direct reflection of what could possibly happen in your school. I think all experts agree if your community is a hot spot, you should probably not be reopening school at this time. Keep school virtual, which means that they can learn at home, they can learn online, which has its own issues, but eventually get back to school. Safety being the priority. And I think also most experts agree, yes, we do want kids to go back to school, but we want to make sure they go back to school in a safe manner. That's the priority here. Safe for them, safe for teachers, safe for staff, and safe for all those people's families when they go back home as well. Big, big issue. So when you look at schools, you have to first look in the community. Is the community, do they have coronavirus under control? If the answer is yes, then look at opening schools. How are you going to do that? You want to make sure you do it safely. Again, that's going to be dependent on where you are in the country and what kind of resources you have. And so it might be 
that if you're in an area that's not a hotspot, it's okay to open, but you don't have that many resources, so you need to think about how you can do that. We know outside's better than inside. Depending on weather, you might be able to move outside, at least temporarily, or you might be able to open a window to get that air to circulate throughout the building, which we know also works better than having the windows closed uh, because of the way the coronavirus spreads. But also you might find that in your city, certain schools are set up to do this. They have more resources than other schools that aren't set up to do this. The main theme here is everybody has to be very creative, very flexible, and very patient because there's a risk and there's a benefit to all this. The benefit to going back to school is obvious. You get kids back to school. Teachers, most parents will agree, teachers do a better job of teaching than the parent themselves does. The parent has other issues going on at the same time, so can't fully devote their time to doing this. On top of that, getting kids back to school for that social development, that mental development, that physical development can be very, very important, especially those who have other challenges. Trying to get those met at school can be an important part of their life. And, and children in particular, uh, there's a lot of children that rely on school for food. They rely on school for other resources. And so that can be a big benefit as well. Those are the benefits. The risk, of course, being coronavirus spreading not just to them, staff and teachers, but to their families as well. You need to keep all that in consideration. So again, there's no one answer for all schools across the country, but it should be looked at with the emphasis of saying, okay, in a safe manner, can we get kids back to school? That's the important part behind all this. Can you get COVID more than once? The question is, can you get COVID more than once? And the answer right now is at least short term, we don't think so. And here's the reason I'm saying that is because short term, you develop antibodies when you get COVID. Those antibodies we think last anywhere from three to six months and they protect you from getting coronavirus again. There's been no documented cases of a person getting coronavirus a second time. There have been cases of people testing positive for coronavirus a second time after they tested negative, but those cases think they come down to either a couple of things, a faulty test, especially the test in between it showed negative, or the test is picking up on viral particles that aren't necessarily the virus itself. So these people are not having coronavirus, they're not contagious. Their body is still trying to get rid of the particles, the parts of the virus that are left over, and that can take some time. As a matter of fact, the CDC now says that once you get tested and once you recover from coronavirus, you should not test again for three months for that particular reason because you could test positive when in fact you don't have active coronavirus and you're not contagious. And so beyond that three to six month time period, we're not exactly sure, but we do know that at least in some people, those antibodies seem to be wearing off, but those are the main antibodies, what are called IgG antibodies. But now comes in a different part of the immune system, what are called helper T cells. Helper T cells are like sentinel cells that basically scat out for the virus. And when they find it, they activate a couple of other parts of the immune system to start kicking in to fight off coronavirus. In some diseases, some viruses, they can do that very quickly. Other viruses, it takes them longer. We're not sure about coronavirus yet, so we're just starting to look into that. But the thought is that if you have those helper T cells, that can help you even if you don't have the active antibodies detectable at this point. So the answer is we simply don't know how long that protection lasts or how good that protection will be depending on where your antibodies are at this time. And that's why I say even if you've recovered from coronavirus, you still need to do the things. Wear your mask, social distance, wash your hands to protect yourself and other people around you. Remember, we've been studying this virus for seven months now, so we're getting a better handle on it, but we're still not there a lot of these viruses have been around for hundreds of years, and we know a lot more about them than we do about coronavirus, which again, seven months in. What's the best disinfectant to kill virus, the COVID virus on surfaces? So the question is, what's the best disinfectant to kill coronavirus on surfaces? And there are a variety of disinfectants out there that work. Your best bet is to go to the FDA website, fda.gov, and they actually have a list of approved uh, disinfectants that can actually kill coronavirus. Now, a couple caveats here, a couple things to know is number one, there's a difference between a cleaner and a disinfectant. Cleaner gets off grime and dirt that you can see, but it doesn't kill the viruses. A disinfectant will kill the viruses. This, so it's important that you get a disinfectant and there's a variety of different substances that work. And that's what I'm saying. Let's go ahead and go to the FDA website to find out which ones have been approved. The other thing with disinfectants is when you do have a disinfectant, make sure you look at the instructions on the can. The reason I'm saying that is because it even surprised me. When you look on the can, for instance, some of these disinfectants say, spray on the surface you want to disinfect and let sit there for 10 minutes and then wipe off if it's still wet. That 10 minutes is important because that's what's working on the virus in that time period and killing the virus. If you do like a lot of us, and I'm as guilty as this as anybody, if you spray and wipe, then you're not getting that killing 
time frame on the virus itself on the surface and so it might not work as effectively. So make sure when you do get a disinfectant, you look at the back of the can to get information on how long you need to use it, how long you need to leave it, let it sit there before it actually works. It needs time to activate, time to kill the virus before you get rid of it. When will I know if of any long-term effects of COVID-19? When will we know of any long-term effects of COVID-19? I get this question a lot. And the answer I usually give is, we'll know about long-term effects over a long-term time period. And the reason I'm saying that is not in a joking fashion, but typically we don't really understand what's going to happen with a virus until we actually see it play out over time. And again, we've been studying this for seven months. And so we know some of the short-term effects that can happen. Some of these short-term effects look like they could be permanent effects. And so you need to keep an on those, particularly effects with lung, brains, especially in children, that's a big issue. Uh, blood clots that can cause amputations or other problems, we know those can cause long-term effects. But the more subtle long-term effects, we don't know about. What's going to happen if somebody has COVID-19 now and their kidney has some issues with it? Will that cause their kidney to have more problems later in life? We're not sure about that. Children that get COVID-19 and they have issues with their brain at this point, will that cause issues 20, 30, 40 years from now? We don't know. And so this is going to take something that's going to take time to study to find out what's going on. And we'll know over time more and more. We'll get more of an idea of what goes on. But the concern is, since this is what we called initially a novel coronavirus, a new virus, we don't know exactly how it's going to affect the body long term. But we are concerned that long term there could be some issues especially in those that are hit very severely right now or those that are hit at a very young age right now. That could cause lifelong problems and problems that go away for a while or seem to and then crop back up later in life. And so something we definitely need to keep an eye on. And another reason we need to do the three W's to protect ourselves. Wear a mask, watch your distance, that social distance, that six feet, and wash your hands to try and prevent coronavirus with the idea that eventually keeping it under control as best we can, we'll get that vaccine, we'll get that herd immunity up high enough, and we'll end up getting coronavirus at least under control. Probably never eliminated, but at least under control in our populations, so it's not as big a concern. Thank you for your questions. These have all been fantastic and phenomenal as usual. And to go over the headlines again, just so you remember them, vaccine, there's a couple issues with the vaccine. There's many out there right now. A lot of them are going through trials. Some of them are in phase three trials. Russia released a vaccine prior to its phase three trial, which is concerning a lot of experts around the world saying, how do we know it's safe and effective? We don't really at this point, would not be approved here at this point in its trial period, but hopefully keeping our fingers crossed that it doesn't hurt many people in Russia. And on top of that, challenge trials. A lot of experts are saying we should not do challenge trials. We should not deliberately infect people with coronavirus just to see the vaccine works, mainly because we don't have a treatment for coronavirus for COVID-19, which we know can have complications and has a death rate associated with it. So it would be unethical to do that. Number two, world, what's happening around the world. We're seeting areas where these lockdowns and these uh, shutting, shutting down of different businesses are starting to reopen. In some places, they reopen too quickly, as in Spain. And now Spain's starting to see a surge in cases again. Hopefully, they get that under control. But it's a lesson to the rest of us thinking, okay, reopening, we need to make sure it's done in a deliberate, slow fashion so we can keep that reopening happening and rolling along like we want it to. And then masks, again. If you have a mask, the CDC put out a big notice. If it's a mask like this with a valve on the side, don't use it because that valve lets the air come out very uh, as freely as it can, which means that the virus could get out there as well. So you want to be careful with that. On top of that, if you're using a, a gator mask like I do, go ahead and double up the fabric. I think that'll help uh, prevent some of the virus from going out there like the uh, single layer doesn't. So it's been a Fantastic questions again. I thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening to this. And hopefully we answered a lot of your questions over this past week. Have a great weekend. And like I always say, you, your family, your loved ones, and your community, please be as happy and as healthy as possible.